Human beings are searching for the personal experience of reality. reality. They are seeking to come to understand themselves, to find a reason for their own existence. And so you go round and round and round, ever chasing the illusion that there is something outside yourself, outside your here and now, to be attained that will make things better. No guru, no method, no teacher, and no nothing else either. In the new age, we are often presented parroted ideology absent of actual substance. It's uncommon to encounter individuals capable of exiting the carousel of conventional conversation of groupthink and braving the wilds of their own brain. Terence McKenna said a shaman is a figure at the beginning of human history who unites the doctor, the scientist, and the artist into a single notion of caregiving and creativity. As we stand at a turning point in human history, the shaman archetype is needed now more than ever before. Today's guest, a modern mystic in her own right, embodies the traits of a true shaman and then some. Her presence is helping heal the collective consciousness by exposing the truth of her experience. She is a witness to the liminal space between our world and what lies beyond the veil. Embodying a name that invokes the essence of an elvish warrior priestess while exhibiting a beauty that is only surpassed by the intrigue of her aura, her wealth of wisdom, and her innate ability to positively impact our paradigm, an artistic essential oil apothecary, intuitive tarot reader, Reiki healer, and teacher, ladies and gentlemen, I give you er, <laughs> Irana. Ad Adorjan, I messed up your name. I did so well with the intro that I butchered your name. <laughs> wow, that, that was really, really beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. I'm flattered and humbled by that. Thank you. Yeah, you're absolutely welcome. Um, how do you say your name since I butchered it? You told me, and for whatever reason, it always escapes me. It's Erina. Erina. I don't know why it's so difficult for me. It's okay. It's yeah. like the prettiest name I've ever heard, and I can't say it properly. <laughs> Erina, what are you grateful for today? This is like how I like to start things off normally. Oh, man, I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful to be talking to you, you know, sharing. Um... Yeah, today's today's been a good day. It's Friday. Hell yeah. Yeah. You can't go wrong with that. <laughs> um so did you feel you were different than other people growing up? Um <clears throat> you'll have to excuse me because I'm getting over a really bad like cold and flu. So I might You're fine. Yeah. Um I you know what? When I was growing up, I did not think that I was any different from anyone. I thought that people were just as sensitive as I am um, and would see the things that I could see. Um, and I have a lot of intuitive people actually in my family. Um, and so there was always kind of like a natural curiosity about like, what does my dream mean? I had a dream about you or like, you know, um, certain things you can do like reading clouds or like making wishes like I feel like that's all part of um kind of the playfulness of like childhood and I had some pretty magical like family members cousins siblings and stuff and we were allowed to like allow our imagination to run wild like in certain moments in certain periods through my childhood so that that's also something I'm very grateful for as well mm. um so I didn't like until recently realize that not everybody is as sensitive and not everybody like can kind of pick up on some of the things that I can pick up on. Um, so, yeah. No, that makes total sense. That's one of the rare occurrences where somebody says, no, your childhood sounds freaking beautiful, by the way. That sounds so amazing. Um, Those are the good parts. <laughs> right yeah that's that's kind of the way I guess it is for everybody there's a little bit of both and everything um so you said it was more recently that you noticed that maybe you were a little bit different looking back when was the first time that you had an inclination that maybe your experience was different than everybody else's 
Well, I know I was a lot more aware of like environmental and like social justice issues like at a young age. I don't know where that came from, <laughs> but I was very, I remember going to like the bookstore and picking, picking up a book like 50 ways you can like save the earth when I was like 10 or 11 years old. So like I always kind of had this like draw to be like helpful or to like I at a young age I could recognize that there were like certain things that were kind of going sideways with how we do things as a collective mm. and like how well how can I make I always had this sense of like I'm here to serve a purpose and to like make things better and to help others and stuff like that so um I remember in high school just like my peers were not in that wavelength at all mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean like even in just like discussions and like government class on like certain social issues and stuff like people just didn't they just didn't care about it you know so which is kind of like normal I guess when you're a teenager like you're just like whatever <laughs> yeah absolutely um I I can relate to some of that because I became aware of kind of my um I don't want to say disdain but how something wasn't right in the world very early on in life and it created a lot of chaos for me actually even in high school I can remember taking like history classes and having um facts that were counterintuitive to what was being taught and kind of being singled out for <laughs> having the true information about it like Christopher Columbus or all these other characters and not being so much like allowed to voice those opinions and my teachers knew that I was intelligent but they didn't like that it was disruptive to everybody else's learning <laughs> yeah right yeah I, I mean there's only so much time in a class period to like dive into the nitty-gritty especially of like his things like history and you know yeah and there's like standard things that they're supposed to teach you and all of that um I didn't have the vast social awareness but i can relate to kind of having a different mindset in a large way yeah. um yeah this is kind of a more fun question to break up some of these other questions if you could have a superpower um or if you have one what would it be um i feel like if i could have a superpower it would be like to heal like any disease mm. um like very easily, like just by like looking at someone or like holding their hand or something. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. What superpowers do you feel that you do have? <laughs> um, oh, I have a few. I, um, I've always been really good at like, like astral travel, I feel like is a superpower. It's like something that goes above and beyond like your normal capabilities. Um, I mean, I'm very intuitive. I feel like that's also a super superpower, just like being around somebody, I can pick up on intuitive information for them. Um, I don't know. I know how to fold a fitted sheet. <laughs> <laughs> make it look neat i think I that's kind of a superpower <laughs> that one's like the most um uh, mind-blowing to me i feel like yeah. <laughs> when i learned how to do that i was just like oh my god it's so simple and makes so much sense and like it works so great <laughs> it's kind of funny how um most of the most complex things actually are really simple but they have so much power in those simple things yeah um and just to like attest to your intuitive abilities i'm kind of a prick when in, in regards to letting people read tarot cards for me <laughs> like i have no problem being honest about it and you were literally probably the most accurate tarot reading i've ever had where it was like even though i read tarot as well it's mind-blowing when people get stuff right about me and they don't know me i'm like oh my god this is real even though like it happens on the other yeah, side of things right. yeah i mean i always have that experience every day like my life is super magical and i but i just can blown away by like the, the the magical things that happen so like you know every time i do a reiki session with somebody just 
like the whole experience just blows my mind, even though I've been doing it for several years. It's just like that, it's that powerful and it's that like, it steps you out of like your normal just way of thinking so much that, um, I don't know, I'm just like blown away by it every time. So I understand when I get a reading for people, I'm just like, I'm blown away myself. And I'm like, <laughs> I think that's a good sign if you can impress uh, someone who already reads, so. Absolutely. Um, since we're talking about like what you do and your Reiki and all that stuff as well, tell me a little bit about that. Like what got you started in that and um, all of that good stuff. Um, it's interesting that you asked that question because the time period that um, I started learning Reiki um, was, it was about 10 years ago and somebody just texted me and was like, telling me that right now whatever the astrological shifts are happening like are they're like clearing out cycles from 10 years ago hmm. so um or no eight years ago I'm sorry so it was 2010 and I just I'm an empath which means like I can feel other people's feelings Mm -hmm. um, and then when I give a Reiki session, I'm also like sympathetically like tuning into whatever's going on with them. And that just started happening spontaneously in 2010, where I would be like sitting next to somebody on the bus or like walking past a person and I would like feel like warmth on my knee or like I'd start to get a stomach ache or a headache and it would just only last for like a few moments. And then, um, but it was, it was me picking up on the other person's issues. Mm. And so when that, I didn't know what was going on when that started happening, but I'm curious enough to like, try to figure it out. So, um, I went to a reader and she helped me to figure out that like Reiki or should I say like hands-on healing was actually part of like my spiritual path. And so she was like, whatever way feels natural to you to learn, then like go for it. So I started researching and found Reiki and then I found a Reiki teacher to give me my attunements and stuff like that. So <clears throat> it kind of started off just, it was just part of what I was supposed to be doing and it just happened. And so like, I was like, okay, like I need to do this, you know? So, um, so just kind of all like flowed from there. And actually when I got attuned to Reiki, like that really snowballed me onto like a new spiritual path too. Mm -hmm. So, um, it just, it just opened up a lot of doors for me and, um, it kind of like, yeah, it just, Reiki is a natural life force. So like, it's going to like, when you tune into it, you're going to get into your natural rhythms of like where you need to be with your spiritual path as well. So it, that's just basically what happened. So, so. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's, that's a beautiful story. I like all of that. Um, can you tell me a little bit about like what your first attunement was like? Cause I just had mine and, and I'd kind of like to share my experience after years just to see sure. the similarities. Um, my memory is not the greatest, no but worries. <laughs> it was 2010. Um, so <clears throat> I originally had two Reiki teachers and um, it was a small group of, I think like four or five people in the Reiki one class. And so basically like they broke down like the history and how to use Reiki and how to like, there's, different attunements so this was the reiki one attunement and so um they broke down like what it is that you can do with this attunement basically you can clear yourself you can clear your pets um and you can like work on children your own children um but you don't start like giving reiki to other practitioner until your second degree so the first degree was super like simple and it was like Basically, we were just practicing our, on ourselves, and then we would practice on one other person. But when I received the attunement, because um, the attunement clears your chakras, 
like I had such a crazy like third eye clearing like I could see just like so much violet light because Reiki is associated with like the violet ray um, which is violet light that you know is in this natural life force that is running through everything and um so I could see all of that and then I remember there being like this huge like heart chakra opening where I was like brought to tears like it was just really beautiful and it was just all in a matter of a few moments like maybe less than five minutes um but it was very very moving it was very moving it was very clarifying like I felt really clear I felt really just like mentally clear I felt um emotionally stable I felt very grounded like it's just, I was just like, oh, this is like how I'm supposed to feel. Like this is, this is like me and my best self, mm. you know? So, yeah. So I'm not uh, going to say, it's not something that like lasts all the time. You know what I mean? Like, but doing the Reiki clearing can get you to that point where like you, you have a sense of clarity. Absolutely. Um, I can relate to some of the things that you shared about the attunement itself. For me, uh, when I was getting attuned at Reiki level one, because that's where I'm still at, I got to start the uh, second class here coming up. But the uh, person who attuned me had to really kind of focus on my heart chakra for a bit because of the life experiences I had. And I felt like this heaviness and then this opening. And there was kind of um, some flashbacks of previous things that had occurred in my journey and kind of this unifying thought process of everything like this is this has been part of your path and you're where you're supposed to be and it was this really intense experience for me um and then since then it's been interesting as some of these old energies are working themselves out of me because it's kind of like they're they're being flushed out of my system to make way for new things mm -hmm. and it's also like this um learning to kind of operate on the next level of my being when I'm kind of not ready for it yet. Um, because for me, one of the biggest sticking points in my life is just like friendships or relationships with people in general, because as a recovering addict and somebody with history of mental health, that's an area of my life that's always lacked. And it's kind of funny because once this has happened and my heart chakra has opened up, I'm trying to, establish friendships and like build things with people but i also don't have any of the tools <laughs> for it like the way that the normal people do but like uh there's been people in the recovery program i'm in reaching out to me where i have to like be present for them just to kind of help guide them uh and let go of a lot of my fear of letting people into my life and it's been incredibly um beautiful terrifying and like all sorts of things but it's it's cool to hear other people's experiences about it um because i find there's a lot of benefit in that stuff let me ask you this too um were you actively kind of working with energy prior to doing like getting formally attuned and all that stuff um not like consciously aware of it um i'm an artist and so i feel like i would definitely put some energy into my artwork um i feel like art making visual arts art like crafts and things even music i guess um because it you're working with vibration whether through color or through sound um that that is a type of energy work in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and you're tapping into like, uh, just the creative energy as well. So communing with that, like that's part of your energy work as well. So, but it wasn't like I approached my art practice in that way. It just kind of was, again, like happened spontaneously. So in 2010, I think I, let's see, um, yeah, I was going through my stay on return. I think I was about 29 years old. And so, um, it was, it was just like destined to, to happen. It was just part, it, like when I look at my chart and everything like that, like, uh, my Saturn return was in, my Saturn is in my first house. So that's like, 
my career, everything, my identity, like who I am, like my whole like just direction in life. It's your first house. So that just completely shifted. Um, you know, so, um, so it just kind of, it just, it just developed naturally, really. Maybe, maybe like making food, you know, like if you're putting your love into something mm -hmm. <laughs> that, you know, that's kind of the kind of thing I would do when I was younger, but like, no, this has definitely been like since in the, like in this eight year phase, like whatever astrologically is like closing out now, um, is, was, this is like where I am now started at that time, you know? Um, so. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. I like how you mentioned the cooking thing too, is somebody with a culinary arts degree. Um, I always am, am curious of, maybe curious isn't the right word. I'm always blown away, I guess, by how much energy impacts the quality of food. Um, just because if somebody really is happy when they're making it and they put love in it, you can taste it. But if also somebody's like uh, a grumpy asshole when they're making something, it doesn't taste good. And I say that from being a grumpy asshole working in kitchens and like making people's food maybe not as tasty as I could have. Why they say you're salty? Oh, you're salty because you make salty food. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the funny things too. Like one of my buddies, um, this is just kind of a rant, but one of my buddies would always give me shit because I never put salt in anything because I was so used to cooking for my grandparents and oh. they have a low sodium requirement <laughs> that he'd be like, dude, you're, you're not a cook. You don't even add salt to anything. It's just <laughs> funny. Um, tell, tell me more about the art like that you make. Um, I make uh, paintings, drawings, um, collage primarily. I also do... Um, installation work which is using a usually a gallery space um and kind of working off of that space in, like impromptu like in an impromptu fashion to create um some kind of just like spatial like I usually use painting and drawing and collage in my installations mm -hmm. so. <coughs> sorry I gotta get some water <coughs> oh no worries do your thing <coughs> Um, but I'm also a graphic designer too. Oh, wow. <coughs> so I do, um, I work for a wallpaper company right now. Okay. Freelance. Yeah. Um, I guess this is a good time to like plug some of your stuff. If people wanted to contact you to purchase some of your art or anything like that, um, how could they get a hold of you? I'll put a link in the description as well, the show notes. Um, purchasing my art is a little complicated right now just because I make individual pieces and I also, I do put them on my website, but I don't, uh, regularly update it. And I'm really bad about that. <laughs> um, because usually when I sell art, it's at an exhibition. Okay. And so what you have to do is you kind of have to like look out for my announcement if I'm having an exhibition locally where I'm showing my art and then you can purchase it there. Um, I am open to commissions. I do commissions, especially around the holidays. Like I've done like paintings for people like portraits and like pet portraits and stuff like that. Um, Cause I am trained as a painter. So, um, you know, normal painting on canvas, just the run of the mill stuff. Um, but as far as my day job, uh, freelance graphic design for a wallpaper company, it's just basically like they're wall murals. So if you've ever gone into like a hotel and you see like a mural wall, it's not really like the pattern like wallpaper, but it may look like, you know, a painting on the wall. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of stuff that we do. So that's super fun because like I can be very creative. They've allowed me to have a lot of creative ability. Like within this job and so I'm just like slapping paint around drawing you know little things and stuff like that and then I have the graphic side where I can like scan everything in and digitize it and turn it into like a digital mural um so it's super fun and then uh as far as my services go like my readings and Reiki sessions um 
I can give you my email uh, to post in the introduction. And then um, I, you can also follow me like on my Instagram page and there's links to, um, to my email or just direct message as well. Um, that's probably the best way to get a hold of me is email or direct message. Um, and then my Instagram is, is just a great source for like free readings because I do lives and for the new moon and the full moon. So I'll give live readings. And if you put a comment as far as your question, um, I'll pull a card for you. And I also pull like general readings for the full moon and the new moon energies. And then um, I don't really do daily readings, but um, I do readings like posts with readings, like of the general energies, um, or just kind of like random stuff that I'm thinking about. Okay, you froze there for a second, but the last thing yeah. I got out is uh, stuff that like, you'll post random stuff that you're thinking about, like readings in regards to that. Okay, Correct. yeah, on, on Instagram. It's, um, so my business is called From the Indigo Chalice. Mm -hmm. um, and I also have an Etsy shop and that's where you can purchase my oils. And that link is also on the Instagram as well. <laughs> I keep seeing, saying the Instagram, like I'm 70 years old. <laughs> the Instagram back in my day. On the Instagram, on the Facebook, like, <laughs> <laughs> like yelling like my grandma or something right now. Like <laughs> get me on the Instagram. <laughs> Anyways, uh, on Instagram, not the Instagram. Um, can they live. contact you? No, I'm sorry. Finish your thought. No, I was going to say we're live right now, actually, on Instagram. And I'll say hi to all my people who are watching, if anybody's watching. <laughs> Hello, people on the Instagram. <laughs> um, can they contact you via carrier pigeon as well? Um, I prefer cat. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Touche. Carrier cat. Carrier cat. Okay. That's the updated service. <laughs> um, so what circumstances do you feel shaped your life? Um, Light little question for you. <laughs> oh gosh. Do we have time for everything? Um, like I said, we can do follow-up interviews sometime as well, too, or just conversations on okay. some of the stuff. So I think first the ma most major thing in my life like as a child was my parents got divorced when I was seven mm. I'm the oldest child so I have a younger brother and I have a younger sister too but she's much younger than me um so it's me and my brother and my mom and um that kind of like breakup of the family and all of the drama and like dysfunction like around that really really impacted me and um and so i kind of was like dealing with that for a while like into like adolescence and stuff and it kind of i mean i was very like empathic and like picking up on everybody's energies but not having the language to like know what that was or any support in that at all you know so so i think it was like those two combined things of like going through something traumatic but then like not really having the resources to like figure out like why am i feeling this way you know um so that made me more proactive in trying to like help myself you know and like okay well i'm gonna do research i'm gonna read i'm gonna i became a vegetarian at like 15 because I was like reading about, you know, like how they treat animals in like the slaughterhouse and stuff like that. And like how environmentally, like how like better for the environment it would be if people used more plant-based uh, diets and stuff. But um, so then like moving forward, um, I just kind of like would do self-study and research just about like anything I was interested in. And then um, when I was 21, I like, I was developing symptoms of like a chronic illness. And so that, um, that really got me into like 
herbal medicine, preventative medicine, and um, and like nutritional medicine. Like like I said, I was like a vegetarian at the time, so I was like trying to like see like if I could make changes in my diet, if that would help support you know like a more balanced. Um, it's like an autoimmune thing, so like balancing that out. So. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of got me on this path of like just being very proactive in like helping myself. And so like then I started getting into like energy work around like 24, 25 when I started seeing like an acupuncturist like regularly again, like just trying to like heal myself from this illness that I had and like doing the research on like what I could do myself. Um, so I just read a lot about like herbs and remedies and like juicing and fasting and all of that. I was like this health nut. <laughs> <laughs> and it, the thing is, is that going through that process became a challenge in itself too because I became like way too like absolutist about it so like I started to realize like okay like there's a balance between light and dark like you cannot just get away from like all of the bad things and everything's fine like that's not how it works like it's about balance so um so that in itself became a detriment to my health like I had to start eating meat again because I became anemic like there was just there was just like this balancing act that was just like came like a pendulum swing into like I had to come to the other side of things mm -hmm. um you know so um then I guess like in 2013 I had a traumatic brain injury and um, I was zip lining at <laughs> my cousin's bachelorette party. We went. <laughs> it was like five women on this adventure course. Adventure course. <laughs> like women who none of them work out. Maybe my cousin works out. I don't know. But like not athletes. Like I used to be athletic in high school and stuff like that but not anymore like you know several of these women would be like up in the tree like smoking cigarettes like in <laughs> zip lining things right and it was just like a bad situation and I was like going on this zip line like over a creek and I flipped upside down and my head hit mm. the ground where my feet were supposed to hit the ground Ooh. my head hit the ground and like dragged for like 12 feet. Ah. And I was going so fast that but even at the end of the line where our guide was waiting for us, like he tried to stop me and caught me and I almost knocked him over. So even though the ground had broken my fall, like I still was going like so fast. Like it was just terrible. So Wow. I'm still in recovery from that. I'm still recovering from that. I have a lot of neurological issues, cervical spine issues, migraines, things like that. So yet again, it's just like, okay, figuring out what it is that my body needs to heal itself, be, it, be its best self. Because when I was post-concussive for like several months up to a year, I was like, I, I didn't realize how bad it was because it was in my brain. Mm -hmm. and so like my brain is like oh it's fine like everything's fine but it wasn't you know like I would be getting super emotional like over nothing just because my heart rate had elevated or whatever and I'd, I'd be like oh my god like what's wrong like thinking something is is going on you know mm -hmm. um so so that was like a ma really really major turning point for me personally in how like how much self-care I give myself like how much time I give myself to rest like I know that I have friends and family out there who like 
struggle with the fact that I will like bail on someone like so quick if I'm not feeling good if I'm not like if if I feel like my ears are ringing or if I feel like I'm getting a headache or my vision is getting blurry or something like that I'm like nope or and it's it's caused me to really tune into myself and take care of myself mm. at like a completely different level than I was before <laughs> and I already was like trying to help myself so I have a lot of respect for um a lot of what you said there's a lot of similarities but obviously differences in our stories as well um I'll touch on some of the similarities real quickly and then maybe sometime you and I can converse off the air about some of the other stuff um but for me, my parents divorced at a very early age. It was incredibly traumatic for me and destabilizing as well. Um, very, very difficult. And I too am empathic and I didn't know how to sort out those emotions. It's interesting to hear that the uh, way that that can actually progress because you kind of went on a, on a self-empowering path and mine was completely self-destructive. Um, I took the opposite road, but it's interesting because education was like a thread too. I misused my intelligence in ways of like looking how to make various drugs, looking at other drugs that I could like take, looking at um, drugs that I could grow like shrooms and all this stuff at like a very early age. So I misappropriated my own knowledge, but it's also one of the things that um, transitioning later on in life was a great asset. Like my thirst for knowledge and just applying it to the topics that I'm interested in now and kind of um, really taking that, uh, I guess the, the word for me would be obsessive quest for more information <laughs> and using it for like uh, self-empowerment. And then something else that uh, really resonated with me um, was the whole balance concept because within the new age circle specifically, or like anybody that's into spirituality, it kind of, uh, I guess the word is pisses me off how much people focus on the positive element of everything and they never focus on the darker element and they even kind of bastardize the darker element. And it's really like there's wisdom in both sides and you have to be in a center point with it. And even um, a lot of esoteric teachings emphasize the center point. Uh, it, it's just interesting how how blind some people are to it or how um, willingly, willingly ignorant, I guess they are of it because it's more pleasant to focus on one thing, but they're only limiting themselves. And that being said, to make myself not sound like such a pretentious asshole, because you said you're, you're part of it very eloquently. Um, <laughs> I also think that's people's path at some point to stay on one pole for a bit to kind of gain more knowledge of it and then transition to a more central point. Yeah. and the, and we all have our own path and we all have our own lessons that we need to like bring in and um, for ourselves in our life, you know? So <clears throat> someone may have addiction on their path and that's part of the, that's all, like, that's a realm that they would enter into to face um, their own fears and uh, face their own demons and things like that. And like, um, for whatever reason, you know, that's on their journey. That's part of their path. That's part of their destiny. Some people may not have to go through that. Some people may have to go through the loss of a child um, or a loss of a family member, or, you know, we all have like these challenges or, or, you know, just going through like living in an unjust society, you know, or like, just like, you know, some kind of injustice happens to you and it's totally unfair, but you have to work out how to accept that in your life and integrate it into the life, into your life. So it doesn't define who you are. Um, cause that's ultimately like what being on a spiritual path is, is being in tune with your authentic self and things like the experiences that we have, although they become interwoven into the fabric of our experience at our core it's not who we are i think that that's such a fundamental point and that's even one of the reasons why i started all of this because it was repurposing my experiences and getting to choose the definition of what that experience meant to me and that's like a big difference between people that um have healthier lives i would say like overall versus people that kind of stay in a more 
um, defeated state, getting to choose what that meant. Like for you, for example, with a traumatic brain injury, you got to choose how you could use it as a way. Not that it was like, I'm trying to think how to phrase this. You, you chose it as a path to like help build yourself up, to take better self-care overall and to like be better for, for yourself, I guess, is how I would phrase it. Not because you wanted to, but you had the option. Some people could stay defeated. And it's kind of similar to my experience where with addiction or mental illness, I could stay stuck and beat myself up and say that I can't change it. Or I can say, this is a blessing in disguise and I can help other people and live a better quality of life because of this. And I think that that's really empowering. Yeah. And I want to say that that like revelation that came to me where I see the the higher lesson in things always comes in hindsight. Like mm -hmm. it, that was one of the hardest things that I had to go through. Like I, I, for a whole year, I was like a crying two year old that needed a nap, like all the time. Like I was, I, I was really, really struggling. And also went into graduate school, like right after it happened. Mm. So, <clears throat> you know, so I wasn't able to give myself the time that I actually needed without looking at a screen, without reading. Like my doctor was telling me like, you basically can't do anything, but like look out the window. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I have to pay bills, I have to work, I have to, you know what I mean? Like I have to be self-sufficient. So like learning how to honor myself, but then also like honor myself by like pushing myself to do the things that I needed to do, finding a balance in that, like, it was really, really, really hard. And I actually didn't, for about a month after it had happened, I hadn't gone to see a concussion doctor. Um, I actually ended up into the ER two weeks after my um, injury, uh, because I was having numbness in my leg, because I just went, I didn't, I, I didn't even go to the doctor after it happened. I just, that's how bad, like, my brain was injured. I didn't think anything was wrong. Mm. I didn't, like, intellectually think, like, okay, I should go to the doctor. I should go get the, like, that's how bad it was. So, like, I ended up driving myself to the ER because my left leg was starting to go numb because I have nerve issues now, like, down my left side. So, I went to the ER and they referred me to the sports medicine doctor who deals with concussions. Cause they were like, we think you just had a really bad concussion. Well, my doctor, he thinks I had multiple concussions at once. Um, and so in that time period until I started working with him and he was telling me, he was like, I want you to keep a journal of everything that like triggers your symptoms and you can't take any pain medication during the day because I want you to know what your symptoms are and, and when they come through. And at night, you can take Advil for pain to help you sleep. And that's it. That's all I could do. And so I had to become very aware of what was triggering symptoms. And then as soon as they were triggered, I had to stop doing that. So I may have to turn off the radio or I may have to stop looking at the screen, you know, or, you know, if I'm reading, I stop reading, shut my eyes. It got me into meditation because meditation, if I meditated for 15, 20 minutes, it was like a reset. Whatever was, whatever symptoms were being triggered, it just like reset everything to where like the trigger and the pain would like go away. Mm. So I had to have a lot of help. So I want to say that is that for as great as your introduction was and as great as like I may seem to be, I had a lot of help along the way. I had a lot of teachers. I had a lot of, um, you know, lessons that taught me, like people who came, people who were lessons that came through my life um, and all of those people, I'm very, very grateful. You know, they may have been doctors, family members, people I was in relationships with, teachers, things like that. Like all along the way, I have had a lot of support and, um, and guidance too. Mm. So. That's a very uh, beautiful response and a very humble outlook on everything. And it, it is good to remember that um, because I know that even in my own experience, sometimes I can oversimplify getting from one point to where I'm at now 
Um, and it's, it's sometimes I forget the, the fact of like not being able to trust my own thoughts or not being able to get out of bed or like not showering for a week or not wanting to be around literally anybody or not feeling comfortable at all in my own skin. Uh, and it's important to remember the journey and not only that, but to also, like you said, acknowledge the other people that made it possible. But one of the things that I found too, is you still have to have a, um, even taking help takes a certain type of character to be able to actually accept help. And then to, you still had to, to do all the footwork of everything. Um, and another thought that really came to mind from all of that is I've talked to a lot of people and for me, like meditation and some of the things that I do now didn't come from necessarily wanting to meditate so much as needing to do it in order to actually get through fricking life. Um, like I had to start practicing mindfulness for, uh, I have borderline personality disorder so it's like I had to be present with my emotions and why I was feeling it and how I was responding and choose responses. And then from that kind of getting into meditation, pretty much like you said, to reset my mind, if I was getting into certain emotional states for you, it was a little bit different, I'm sure. But there's like similarities in our journeys there. Um, and I just find that fascinating how it's never just like, I'm just gonna meditate. It's like, I have to do this or I cannot function. Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh yeah, it, like I said, that's how my journey began. It was out of necessity. It was out of me wanting to improve the quality of my own life and taking my life in my own hands. And mm -hmm. I and I look back at it now and it's like it really is that exchange uh, between peers and teachers and mentors and doctors and things like that is all part of it because now <clears throat> I go on and I teach people, you know, like how to use their intuition. You know, I teach um, systems of divination to people or I'll teach Reiki and give Reiki to them. And so I'm like putting my hands back in service in order to help others to help themselves and others as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that in itself comes from that like early just that I can do to make an impact as far as what I'm doing here on this planet in this life experience you know so I find it awesome how um easily accepting you are of like taking teachers and all of that stuff for me like taking teachers on the spiritual path is something I'm kicking and screaming to do no it's really hard <laughs> it's really hard like my Reiki teachers like I took a long time to find the right one and then I found um, a woman who was actually the mother of one of my students at the time I was teaching art classes to kids and I really just I loved her energy like her kids were great like you know um, and I kept bugging her like when are you giving a class and it took like a year it took for her to be like okay I'm ready to like give a class and she got a partner to help her and um but it was it was it was a real blessing to find um really good teachers because i also have a spiritual mentor as well who helped me um learn how to read and we did a lot of like psychic practice psychic practice and journeying and like past life regression and stuff like that um and mediumship she's a medium and so she taught me that as well and she's a blessing. She's like a second mom to me. You know what I mean? So like, um, <clears throat> and our relationship has had challenges. It's just like any other relationship. You know what I mean? You just have to know that like, it's, you're going to have like, people are going to have their own things that they are doing in their life too. And so like, when we have a path with someone like a teacher or a friend or a relationship or anything like that, it's, you're going to have a pat time when you're like, together on the path like perfectly and then you have times where like you have to go do this you have to go do that you know what I mean like they'll come back you'll come back around like some some relationships are like that you know so mm -hmm. um and they go through their cycles and stuff like that I've seen that a lot with like family members too you know 
and um, where if you allow your relationships to evolve and you don't get stuck in like, oh, well, that person did that like 20 years ago and they're the same person, they're just going to do that again or whatever. Like, I think if you let people evolve and grow and you let yourself evolve and grow and like know that you're allowed to, you're, even if you have a teacher and, um, your teacher is very like strict and like, I want you to do this like by the book. Like you have to just know that like, we're all sovereign beings. Like you can just quit if you don't want to, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like you're allowed to like figure stuff out on your own. And when I realized that I was like, Oh, okay. I'm going to just like create like the things that create the direction that I want to go into. But not really because I'm like also listening to my intuition to follow like where I need to be if that makes sense I don't know no, I, I can I completely get it it's taking information from other people then filtering it through your own experience to kind of create how you see it should be for you so it, it's it's working does that make sense like a workable system for yourself based upon others experience and your own sure which I, I think is what we're supposed to be here to do. Because if everybody just copied what everybody else was doing and told them all the time, we wouldn't have any individuality. <laughs> so that, that's why I like Reiki too, because because it's the universal life force. It's a natural life force. Like it is in itself creative energy. Mm. And so, like you know, even you look at plants and you look at a species of a tree, right? And so they all have like unifying identifi identifiers, like the bark and the shape of the leaf and the fruit that it grows and things like that, and the average height or whatever. But each tree is different when it grows, when it expresses itself. So like, I kind of look at it like I do and the spiritual path that I do as a very natural, organic, like growth process to where like, it's, it's allowed to expand where it needs to expand and it's allowed to reach out where it needs to reach out. And then it's allowed to like contract in too. And like, I can change and switch things up anytime I want to. I think that that's really important to remember in anything. It's one of the lessons that I've really been um, beginning to understand on a deeper level that how dynamic everything in life is, unless we have a rigid, uh, mindset towards it and for me like having a closed mind about a lot of things how constricting that is and how it prevents the ability to really experience the richness of life but when you can open your mind up it is like you said where it takes on this organic um dynamic growth process and it's like more fluid and it's so much funner that way <laughs> like yeah um fun is definitely a huge part of growth too like just enjoying the process i think that that's crucial it's something i'm actively working more on uh, this is kind of a side note and i'll get back into like some of the other questions but it's like in my own life i was looking at how i was in, in active addiction and like how fun and playful and all of these other um traits that i embodied to the one extreme where they were destructive but now that i'm in recovery i look at how far i've gone to the opposite end of the spectrum and it goes back to the balance thing where like I need to kind of embody some of the traits that I actively use substances to cultivate in my personality to balance myself out. Um, but I have to do it through like actually enjoying doing stuff and being fun and like letting myself be who I am. Um, so it should be a fun process. Well, that indicates you may have some inner child work to do. Like, oh man. <laughs> and just give it a hug and like ask, what ask him what he wants and like it'll usually be like candy or something or like <laughs> run around in the field and the field will just appear in front of you like you know just go through the visualization process of connecting to <clears throat> that inner child um and that will kind of bridge you to your own inner innocence that we all have a lot of times we go through traumatic experiences that like shatters that innocence or or what is it? it kind of like dulls it or something like that but it's not something that you can't get back mm. i think that's a good a good way to put it it is reachievable i just have to maybe um 
consciously work at it, not just expect it to fall in my lap. Nothing good comes easy. <laughs> um, I'll definitely have to take you up, like take that as a thought and maybe ask you some questions off air sometime about some other things that I could do about that because I'm intrigued. Um, Your child work is definitely a part of my session that I offer in Reiki healing. So that's a part of it, like chakra balancing um, your inner child, like connecting with your guides, things like that. Okay, very cool. I might have to, might have to hire you to help me with that at some point mm -hmm. then. This is kind of a fun question. Uh, what songs or bands have lyrics that most resonate with you at the moment? Okay. I <laughs> This question is really tough for me because I am a music lover, but um, I don't listen to like a lot of like spiritually conscious music or anything like that. I listen to kind of like the most garbage music. <laughs> okay, that's fine. That's part of my like shadow side or whatever. But um, I do get messages through song lyrics. I, I get that. I, I can relate to I that. Only that. But I connect on the astral too musicians specifically like in terms of like celebrity people who are out there like i have had channelings where musicians who have crossed over have come through or i'll connect to like the higher self of like cardi b okay it's so, it's so random and you're like okay hey hi this is interesting but that's another thing that i kind of inherited from my teacher because that started happening to her when we were like doing a lot of journeying together and like i'm like a sponge so just like when she was going through that i just it just like clicked within me like i started just like absorbing a lot of the things that she she was like investigating at the time so mm. that's very cool <laughs> kind of weird but i don't think anything is necessarily weird uncommon um intriguing all sorts of good things uh what philosophy spirituality or religion religions do you find most aligned with your understanding and can you explain how they apply to you <sighs> okay so I don't know if you could tell i'm not a religious person <laughs> most people are i just ask it just in case <laughs> Um, I used to be kind of religious, like growing up, um, but I always kind of considered it more spiritual, I guess, which I don't know if there's necessarily a, a difference, honestly, but, um, I guess the term would be like eclectic witch. So like I've been investigating like more pagan like ceremonies and things like that in the last eight years or so um prior to that i was on a very strict um path through judaism um like almost very close to orthodox mm -hmm. i was on that path for about 10 years um and then prior to that um i was raised christian and so i think i pick from each of these traditions so like i do I still read like scriptures in the Bible. Um, I connect with angels. I connect with, um, I recently connected with like the prophet Elijah. Um, so I do have roots in like the Judeo Christian uh, faith. Um, I have connected to Jesus, Yeshua, like Mary, like, you know, these ascended masters who um, are very very real and very present um in my experience and um but i wouldn't consider myself like a christian per se as far as like i believe that we're saved from you cut out for a second last thing i got you were like frozen in air quotes like uh for <laughs> we're not saved which i agree like you're not saved there's not one pathway yeah, you're not saved from like hell and damnation because if you look, people are in hell now, presently. Like you don't have to die to go to hell. It's a state of mind for sure. It's a state of mind. Um, it's it's being completely consumed like within your ego. So I've also studied Eastern religions like Hinduism, Buddhism, um, 
Taoism? A little bit of, yeah, a little bit of Taoism, a little bit of Sikh. Um, so I'm just now starting to kind of like read from the Quran because I have a really good friend who I'm mentoring who is Muslim. So, um, so I think that there is, I was always taught by my teacher that um, you don't, have to have a specific name to call God or source or the universe or anything just as long as you call that is what's important mm. is if you reach out to spirit so I've gone through times where I've I've you know connected to spirit by just being like okay the universe I'm going to put it out to the universe I have connected to spirit by studying about different goddesses I used to be super just into like goddess religion. I, that's even one of my books, you know, just on the feminist piece, like God is a woman, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like really investigating the divine feminine. Um, and now, now the, now for me, it's like, okay, well we're bringing in like the divine masculine and like the duality there again, yet again. So again, we, we see this like pattern of like expansion or contraction or like these polar opposites, you know, you're just mm -hmm. back and forth. So, um, yeah, so I guess it's like eclectic. I do consider myself a witch, um, casting spells, healing spells, um like focusing on attuning with the lunar cycle um which is also very present in judaism too so it all kind of like connects i find the threads that connect that work for me and then like i just go with that <laughs> mm. yeah some people might take like no you have to do it like by the book and i used to be like that too but I'm happier now, so. I completely get it. That's how I am too. It's like a buffet style spirituality where I kind of take a side of what works for me and leave the other stuff. Leave the um, trying to think of food that I don't like to say I can't think of anything. It's well, horrible. maybe, but maybe it's not that you don't like it, but you filled up your plate and then you go back the next time and you try something else. You know. I like the way that you put that. Yeah. You know, that's, that's a good, that's a good have so much capacity for understanding. And honestly, we're not going to understand everything. And there's a lot. So the other side of this is like, there's a lot of like truth that's been hidden. There's a lot of truth that's been warped and perverted. And that's why I can't be by the book a religious person, because I also have studied history, history of like the whole uh, evolution of Christianity and how mm -hmm. it became politicized for like world domination and for the destruction of indigenous culture and like all of these things. So it's like, no, I cannot be a religious Christian or a religious Jew because of those things that like, you know, the like homophobia and stuff like that, that I just can't, not, cannot align myself with. Absolutely. They're very, um, a lot, like set up for manipulation, control, and disempowering people's actual experience and creating an intermediary between people and actual connection with the universe, what it, mysteries, whatever you want to call it. Um, I dig and then, it. And then I feel like when I kind of stepped on the more like investigating like paganism and like witchcraft and stuff that opened me up to the shadow side that opened me up to like, the like the crone aspect of the goddess is the dark goddess like the goddess the moon like it has a light period and a dark period and that is something that I resonate with for myself because I'm like I although like I try to be a good person I am human and I fuck up too you know what I mean mm -hmm. like I have like a lot of shitty behaviors that I try to unlearn and unpack and and things like that but I'm not perfect, you know? So like I've had to integrate and get to know my shadow too, because if you just try to lock it away in a closet, that's why, that's why you have skeletons in your closet that just jump out, you know? Like, Absolutely. <laughs> no, I, I completely agree with that. And I think that that's one of the reasons why some of the people that are 
the most religious or most saved or whatever can be some of the biggest assholes because they don't acknowledge the darkness of some of their own behavior and they don't honestly evaluate how they are. Um, I know for me, like getting in tune with my shadow side, like was uncomfortable, but there's so much power when you can direct that energy towards positive ways. And until you actually acknowledge it, um, you're limiting your experience and it has power over you if you're not aware of it. Yeah, very cool. For sure. This is like a very simple, light, easy question. Um, what do you perceive as your life's purpose? <laughs> <laughs> Basic everyday stuff. Come on. <laughs> this is something that I've pieced together over time. You know, um, because I feel like there's there's like an overarching life purpose of like life lessons that you learn throughout your whole life. And then I think that there's like mini lessons or mini missions, mini purposes. Like one day it may be your purpose to like cook a meal for your friend who's sick or something. I don't know, you know what I mean? But um, so I know, I know that at a young age, I wanted to be an artist. And that's what I do. I know that's part of my purpose. I know that part of part of that training and all of that time and effort in like learning skills like drawing, painting, um, and then thinking critically about the images I was making caused me to really open up my intuitive gifts as well. Absolutely. Even drawing is all right brain and your intuition is all right brain. So like it's really, I was really just building muscles that way, like brain muscles. So, um, so that is definitely, and then I channel uh, messages through the art too. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm just now kind of like accepting the fact that that happens. Because <laughs> that's not something that's really accepted by artists or for artists. Like a lot of artists like do intuitive work, but you're kind of looked at as like, <coughs> you have to have a better reason than just <coughs> something, you know, mm -hmm. out, out there. <coughs> Sorry. No, I understand people like over overcomplicate it somewhat. <coughs> Yeah, no worries. Throat chakra. Mm. One of the things that I would really say about a lot of that too is in my own experience, learning symbol literacy and then being um, somewhat of an artist, although not trained and not maybe in a traditional sense, learning to apply symbolism to try to maybe elevate people's consciousness or transmit ideas that I didn't feel comfortable comfortable verbalizing or just things of that nature, even with just the intention of affecting change in reality by the artwork um, has been a big part of my process. And if you really look at it, tarot cards themselves are transmitting massive amounts of information just through the art. And I think that there's so much power and allowing intuition to direct the intention that you're instilling in the artwork because then you're directly transmitting information from source in a way that's affecting the subconscious of people in a, a positive way if, if that, i don't know if i articulated that clearly i'm sure that you probably understand it but yeah that makes sense for sure um hmm you had such a, a deep life purpose. I feel like every day you wake up, you're working towards that goal. So the next question is kind of moot. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, I would say like, no, it's hard. It's hard to stay on the path. Like, even though I've been on, I've been doing this for a long time. Like, I kind of look at it like a video game almost, although I don't consider myself a gamer at all. I don't I don't really play video games but I used to when I was a kid and so like I get the concept of like each level you complete the next level gets harder mm -hmm. 
I mean, I know not not every video game has levels, but when I was a kid, it was like Mario Brothers. So Back like, in my day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Before the Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it was like, it was those level up games, you know what I mean? Where you're just going to like, and then you meet the boss at the end. You know what I mean? And like, I've definitely met some bosses and I've definitely had some like big challenges. So like, to to like, go back to your question about like, what do I need to feel to like, feel like I'm continually like working on my goal. Like I have to consciously do that. I have to like consciously like, get back on my path, whatever it is. Mm. If it's focusing on my businesses, like if it's focusing on my health or like, taking care of my dog like like I have to I have to consciously just like focus on that um I get it I can get I can get into my you know lulls artist blocks things like that you know like so so gaining the perspective of like even if you need to take a break and that's part of it and like just having that awareness of it and allowing yourself that will help you to get back onto like your purpose because it's part of your purpose it's not like you even really got off your purpose you know? mm -hmm. it's interesting that you bring that up because that's pretty much where i'm at now where like i have to take a rest in order to move forward with things because i'm so fucking burnt out and the uh the guy that's my sponsor pretty much set like i sat down and went over my third step with them recently and he's like you got to take a break to move forward you're trying to do too much and you need to relax and you actually you need to have more fun and you need to let people into your life. And I'm like, dude, I don't have time. And he's like, I know that's why you need to relax. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> I think that's a good point to remember though, that um, sometimes your purpose is to take a break from your purpose. So you can actually bring like vitality and the energy that you'd like to show up with to it. Um, this is probably the hardest question that I ask people. If you had to describe your personal philosophy or condense your life experience into a few words, what would it be? I don't know, because I'm long-winded. You get three words, four words max. <laughs> and it's going to be the title of the episode, too. So no pressure. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm a dick, I know. Six words for you, yes. For you, yeah. yeah. No, 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 I don't want any special. <laughs> oh, damn, um, no special treatment. Okay, you get no, three I words. Then. You, I was gonna give you the name of my th thesis project, but then when I was like, I don't, if that's gonna be the title, I don't of this show, I don't think that that would fit. Um, you actually lost a word now, too. You only get three words. Okay, I'm going back to six then. <laughs> this is the title. This is the partial title of my thesis. Okay, so, and my thesis is like, that's what it is. This is like my, this is what I want to say, right? Um, embracing the unknown allows for surprises. Mm. That's incredibly beautiful. I really like that a lot. I'm going to have to write it down so I can remember it for the title. Embracing the Unknown. Allows for surprises. Yep. So beautiful. Okay. We only have two more questions left. Who inspires you? Hmm. That's a really good question question I have a lot of really great friends who inspire me um they um I see them go through their individual challenges and I see them you know get into their lows and I see them like get themselves back up and I see them like working really hard um I mentioned my mentor. She inspires me. She's like the toughest lady I know. Um, I have a ton of artists 
that I love that inspire me as well. Um, my family, like my brother really inspires me. Um, my sister really inspires me. She's 17 and she's like, she's just so like artistic and like free spirited and just she's she's really she's always been very like she knows like what she wants but then she also goes to this like indecisive thing where it's like it's almost like she knows what she wants but like then she also like opens up to other possibilities too mm. cool. yeah um you know, because she's a teenager, she's still trying to figure everything out. But it's just really inspiring to see her whole process of that and to like be, you know, someone that she looks up to as well. So, but yeah, I think that's, that's it. Very cool. I mean, I'm 34 and I'm still trying to figure shit out. So, <laughs> um, I really love it when people say that their family and uh, their friends are their biggest inspirations in lots of ways. Like, it makes makes my heart like so happy like does a tap dance or whatever because it's so beautiful to have that many sources of inspiration centralized around you and i really feel that if more people could cultivate that attitude of seeing inspiration on a day-to-day -day basis and the people closest to them that the quality of people's lives would improve drastically because oftentimes people kind of get inspired by these people that they have no connection with, no direct interaction with, and it makes it seem almost, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Impossible to achieve some of the things because these people are so far removed. But when you're constantly engaged with people um, that you see bringing out the best in themselves and they like reflect that in you, like they see that in you, that's freaking beautiful. And it takes a very big heart to like have awareness and presence with that. Uh, so I, I always get like excited about that. <laughs> okay. This is the last, but not the least question. It's one of the funnest ones. Um, what quotes are you inspired by? No, I'm joking. <laughs> what books would you suggest to others? Okay. So I have my books. Well, some of them. Not all the books we can do. When you come on again, we can do all oh, the books. Yeah. <laughs> So for like energy work for basic stuff, and this is backwards, but Hands of Light mm -hmm. by Barbara Ann Brennan. And then there's another sequel, Light Emerging. This goes more into like psychological things um, as far as like helping people to um, develop where they have been underdeveloped psychologically. Um, this is a really great book, Women Who uh, Run With Wolves. So this is like more like philosophy. It's the, um, it's writings on the wild women, woman archetype. So this is a feminist book that goes into like um, allegorical stories about the wild woman, like being, being a liberated woman, being empowered um, or feminine, I should say. Um, the Language of Letting Go, this mm. is a meditation book by Melody Beatty, and my mother would be so proud of me for <laughs> giving this book a shout out, but this is all about um, codependency, and it's a daily meditation, so you can read just like one page a day, which is nice. Um, this book is is really interesting and it's kind of not well known. It's called The Continuum Concept by um, Jean Leidloff. So she, this is an anthropologist who studied indigenous cultures in South America and she found that um, her theory is that the problem with Western culture is that we do not hold our babies for long enough periods of time. Mm. And it can, it's that simple that at, in infancy, um, when a baby, before a baby can like crawl on its own, should always be held by another person. And the fact that we don't 
have that is what causes a lot of um, attachment issues, um, you know, like psychological issues and things like that. And to where we have these feelings of like despair and loss that are, are so like coming back like from infancy that like we can't pinpoint them it's not like you can even like work it out because it's just it's just something that like you knew you needed like on a genetic level you knew you were coming into this life on a like a, like a cellular memory of like expecting to have that like um that kind of closeness with other people and when, you know, you don't get that and like, so you're like always feeling like you're missing something, you know, mm. so I can definitely relate to, but, um, <clears throat> so I work with stones a lot. So this is a really, one of my favorite books, Love is in the Earth, a kaleidoscope of crystals. So like, this has like every crystal, even crystals that I don't know what they are, like the grandite, I've never heard of that, you know, like iridosamine so like she has all the astrological like correspondence to to the crystals like all of the health purposes and stuff like that magical purposes um, um and as far as like the spiritual side of religion like the great cosmic mother you're discovering a religion of the earth this really opened my eyes to like how um, in hunter-gatherer societies, like we, the original re religion was a goddess worship religion, and that, um, you know, like the patriarchal religions and societies kind of like took what it is that they wanted from that, and then they come in, mm. and just, like getting into that whole like idea of like how how that in itself was a trauma that then has like rippled out and like the consequences from that, you know? Um, and then I'm also into herbs and I love Scott Cunningham's encyclopedia of magical herbs. Mm. Or encyclopedia of magical herbs. This is a great one. So I have a bunch of books about the medicinal purposes of herbs too, but I love this one because it talks about like how to use them magically. So very cool. I try to um, give you a little bit of everything. <laughs> no, I think that that's so awesome. I wish you could quit being so cool for one second. Like I don't think people read it enough. So it's amazing to have somebody who has that many books that they're passionate about. Um, and as far as Melody Beatty, I have her book Codependent No More because that was suggested to me as a, a good read um, for somebody with some of my stuff. I could talk to you about some of the stuff that you said about the books for hours probably, but just to keep it very brief and on, on a point, I think it's interesting that the one that you brought up about how children being held, how that impacts people on a large level, because thinking about it, like when you were talking about it, in Native American cultures and a lot of those tribal cultures, they have the baby like right on them. And then skin on skin contact and touching people creates oxytocin. So it's like, that's the happy chemical. And it's, it's very fascinating to really think about the impact that would have psychologically on people. Um, and I think that that's probably a very useful study. As far as the uh, book of crystals, I forget the name of it. I have that same book. And that book's incredibly rare anymore because I don't think it's in print anymore. And it's wicked expensive. Like I had such childlike glee when you held it up. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's a series too. Um, I have, there's two other books in this series. And one has, it's all the photographs of the minerals, mm. specimens. And then the other one is about creating crystal grids. So I also use crystal grids. And so I have that one. I don't have the other book um, with like the photographic identification because we have Google. Mm -hmm. you, know, like, <laughs> you can just Google the image, you know, maybe one day I'll get that book. So I'll have like the series, but yeah. So. Yeah, I didn't know it was a series and crystal grids are definitely something that I'm fascinated by. Um, it's something I've been beginning to incorporate in how I set up for shows and stuff. I could talk to you for hours about all this stuff because the more we talk, the more I am like interested in what you're talking about. Um, I don't want to hold you up anymore though. 
Erina, thank you so much for coming on. Like, this was so much fun to me. Hopefully, I wasn't too nerdy and like over enthusiastic about everything. Obviously, I'm a nerd too. So, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't call you a nerd. I find all that stuff amazing. <laughs> um, but anyhow, thank you so much. Uh, you're welcome to come back on whenever you'd like. I know that you have more stuff that we had kind of talked about, and I'd love to hear more of it. So. Thank you very much and have a blessed day. Thank you.